Warning. This podcast may contain spoilers for whatever TV show or movie is mentioned. Please listen at your own discretion. Welcome to Viewers Anonymous. Yo, what's going on? I am Scoots Bronson. And I am S. Foster. And this is the Views Anonymous podcast. What's going on with you, my boy? Man. Been around you too long, man. Everything's slow motion right now, man. Hey, ain't nothing wrong with it's, that. That's like, a good sign. Yeah, I know, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, still, still working on some things. Um, you know, just waiting to get that confirmation. Mm-hmm. And all that, but you know, other than that, though, um, you know, other than dealing with these, dealing with these allergies and all of this type of shit, man, I'm doing all right, man. I'm doing pretty good, man. I can't really, can't really complain about too much, man. But how you feeling, man? Man, I'm feeling good, man. Um, so you know, what I'm saying, I, like I told you, man, before we got started, when I didn't check out a um, photography studio, man, and did my little due diligence with that. When in, you know what I'm saying, got a look. They did a, a walkthrough with me, and, man, that bad boy is nice. So, um, you know what I'm saying, I actually got a place to be able to, you know what I'm saying, do my photo shoots for OnlyFans and shit like that. So, you know what I'm saying, got everything in order, man. Right now, I'm just trying to get the clientele. So, I'm lining them up as I speak. I had to um, do some extensive research and find uh, models, OnlyFans models, who were uh, in uh, Dayton, Ohio. So I found a few, messaged them up, just waiting on, you know, sending a reply. And shit. And it'd be going on from there, man. Still man, getting listen. them DMs, though, so I'm good. Man, listen, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you what you need to do. And after this happened, you're gonna blow the fuck up, right? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead, DM bad baby. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna Hell blow no. up. No. <laughs> fuck no, fuck no, bro. No. <laughs> Mm-mm. Hey, you know what I'm saying? that's a, that's a great idea, but nah. Hey man, get get you a piece of that uh fifty two million, man. Mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want my hands on none of that. Nigga, she like what twenty? She can't even drink. I'm cool, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cool on that, man. Oh uh, man, yeah, that's crazy though. Yeah, but uh, salute for getting that money. I mean, for sure, you can't hate on it, man. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Um, and the, and shame on all you rat bastards that was waiting on that little girl to turn fucking eighteen. Fucking <laughs> <crazy>. <laughs> that shit was wild. Bro. <clears throat> like if you, I, I was in, I was in a couple groups, like on some, on some different like forums and shit. I was mm. in a couple groups where niggas was really like on some wild shit. Like it was just one dude. He got kicked out of one of the groups because he kept talking about her, and the um, the moderator kept saying like, "Yo, bro, like that's a fucking child. Like we, that's not what we here for." Like you know what I'm saying? And um, dude just kept bringing it up like, "Man, I can't wait to see turn 18. Man, I can't wait." To-. Yo, like my nigga, relax. Like fuck on with you, man. Niggas is wild, bro. Yo, it it is it is some sick individuals out here man mm-hmm. um very sick but from what i heard um and that's just really listening to as much content that i listen to from mm-hmm. what i heard she's not showing anything it's not like one of those types of only so uh, um, i don't know about that I, I mean look i don't know I don't, I don't i ain't never been on there i'm just saying that's what i had heard i heard that she's not really showing that and i don't know what she's doing is I remember, um, there was some celebrities. No, I, like, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen the pictures. Oh well, look, well, you know better than me. I'm yeah, just saying like, this is just what I. That's what I'm heard. saying. Like in one of the forums that I'm in, like it's this thing that they got to where like they just post a picture, and then they'll like the title of the the room or the title of the, I guess you call it a room because it's different rooms in the forum or whatever, but. In one of the rooms, like they got her name on there, and then they got her picture on there, and it just lets you know, like in that room, it's all the pictures that they got of her, all pictures and videos and shit that they got of her. Yeah, see, you, 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 but man, you speaking in the language. 
I'm not even know that. <laughs> Trust me, yeah. hey man, listen, you you know me, man. Like, bro, I'll be I'll be in places that I'd be surprised I'd be in sometime, man. <laughs> One time, I ain't gonna lie, one time, like, the craziest room I got in was, like, it was this room where this chick was naked. Her OnlyFans is naked ASMR. So she's naked, but she's just eating. Yo. Yeah. No comment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. I was watching this shit, like, this nigga's really... Really watching this motherfucker like it's it's people that's really paying for that shit. Yo, that's why I say, man, like you you never know the type of people that you're living amongst. You know what mm-hmm. they doing in their private time. You know they're just like, you know the, the nigga that this, was on that did the the uh, Joe thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, this dude was in high school. <laughs> Talking about bro. this shit, it's like, bro, what? Like you, you, you got into this that early? Can you imagine? Oh no, it's it. It get way wilder than that. Like nigga, when I was in high school, we had a dude that used to like feet. That's when I first found out, like about the foot fetish shit. He used yeah. to like feet. So like he used to be rubbing girls' feet in school. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, do yeah. I want a girl to have pretty feet? Yeah, but it's not like a. Like a, you know, what I mean, you know, kind of like, is that, a, remember, is that like hey, a real thing, boomerang? Bro. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Right? <laughs> he was sliding up the thing, looking at her toes and shit. He said, he said she had hammer time in her feet. <laughs> hey, bro, is that real though? I don't know. I mean, I've never. I'm saying, really... like, like for you, like if you see a girl that and you think her feet ugly, you are gonna be like, nah, I'm cool. I mean, I don't know. I never came across any that had like that I was involved with that had ugly feet. So she, I don't uh, know. But that I'm wasn't sure. the first thing I saw, though. You know what I mean? Like, no, for sure. But I'm just, saying, like, it's, it's dudes like it's dudes that's like they they be all in on that shit. Like, no, 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 no. no it, like, ain't listen, nothing, it ain't nothing like that. Let me tell you something about this shit, bro. I'm I'm, I'm gonna make it short so we don't go too long on this. But like, being in this world of OnlyFans, like. I'm starting to realize, like, it's a lot of shit out here that I'm not privy to. Yeah. Like, nigga, it's feet pages. Like, where they don't show nothing but their feet. They oil them up and put them up there. I don't understand that, but they, it's, like, they got hella people on their page. Like, it's niggas up there that just, like, feet. It's niggas that, like, uh, like, it's just one girl, all she do is just, she got tattoos. Like, she got a whole bunch of tattoos. But I guess it's, like, people that like that shit. So, like, she don't do nothing but wear, like, tattoos. I mean, wear tattoos. She got her tattoos, but she don't wear nothing but bikinis. Mm-hmm. That shit crazy. She don't never get naked. She just put her bikinis on. Yo, that's the... Uh, I mean, I don't think that this is the OnlyFans, but I only see it because I follow... Um, what's your boy's name? Sway the Remix guy. Mm-hmm. And, like, he just be posting, like, random shit sometimes. Mm-hmm. And... I've seen this girl. It's this girl who the first time I've noticed it was she was eating like a raw fish. Just biting it. Like the whole thing. Like bit she bit like the stomach and then mm-hmm. she bit the head. Mm-hmm. Just chewing it. You know what I'm saying? Oh. So so he posted like yesterday or the day before, same girl. It looked like this one was cooked, mm-hmm. but she was just eating a dog. Like, just biting it. Um, and I'm like, this is my thing. She's getting famous for just eating nasty shit. Like, it's weird. It, it's weird. I don't like, want it that bad. It's like, why would you even post it on your page? Like, I wouldn't even... I wouldn't even entertain this shit. Like, I don't even like looking at it. It's kind of like, you know, I'm just struggling and I yeah. see. And it's like, it's one of those things where, like, the video, it's like when you stroll and the video automatically start playing. Mm-hmm. So, like, you, you see, like, it's like it comes like she's holding it and then she just take a big ass bite of it and chew it. Oh, fuck no. Yeah. It's like, yo, this is like, it's, it's shit that I, it's, it's a lot of shit that, like, I can't look at. Like, I don't watch fight videos. I will not watch fight videos. I don't like that shit. That shit is stupid as fuck to me. 
Um, partially because it's incriminating, and then secondly because it usually don't be a real fucking fight. It'd be like some bullshit. And then I don't like seeing like like uh accidents and shit happen to motherfuckers. Like a motherfucker be walking down the street, get hit by a car or some shit. Like I don't want to see none yeah. of that shit. Or like uh my dude sent me this one page where it was like straight uh work related accidents. I don't want to watch that shit. Oh hell no. Yeah, I, I don't be anything that's like as far as somebody getting like ran over or hit or shot or uh cut or any any kind of shit like that. Nah, I can't watch that shit, man. Yeah, nah, fuck that. I could do the but, movies all day, but like yeah. as far as knowing it's like real shit, like with a with a real person, nah, I can't do that. Nah. To eat your own, man. Like yeah. that's what y'all put with. You know, that's on y'all. I mean yeah. I personally can't do it. That shit a little weird, man. Um so anyway, man, um uh, moving on to uh the movie that we got today, man, this is uh, considered a hood classic. Um, white people call it a coke classic. But this movie um, kind of helped define a generation in a sense. It kind of gave light to um, what people were living, um, you know what I'm saying, the, the lifestyle of a young black uh, youth. That's redundant as fuck. The uh, lifestyle of black youth. There we go. Um, in South Southern California. Well, is it? Well, LA? It was, was it LA? Yeah, South Central. Yeah. Okay. So you know what I'm saying. And South Central, Los Angeles. Um, basically, it was. You know what I'm saying. Showing um, from from childhood to young adulthood of uh, four friends who were growing up in South Central Los Angeles um, and dealing with uh, the complexities of life being, you know what I'm saying, Black youth in the, in the times of late 80s, early 90s, um, coming off of the crack, well, not coming off of, in the midst of the crack epidemic, in the midst of gangs in the midst of racism and everything else. Um, we're talking about the John Singleton classic, man, Boys in the Hood. Um, when did this joint come out? 1991, 1990, yeah, 1991. We, missed that, we missed the anniversary last year. Yeah, yeah, we did. That sucks. But um, it's funny watching this. And, and you know what I'm saying, seeing this, especially as an adult now, because you you know what I'm saying, you see so many similarities as a kid, especially when, you know what I'm saying, watching them when they was children, you know what I'm saying, with the, the dudes that was going to steal, you know what I'm saying, the football. And, well, not the dead body part besides that, but just like, you know what I'm saying, them walking around the places like these niggas was going like four or five neighborhoods over. You know what I'm saying? Like, just yeah. on a daily basis. Like, you know what I'm saying? Just being able to really have that type of freedom as a child. Like, nowadays, you know what I'm saying? Like, kids can't do that no more. Because, yeah. you know, that you worry so much about, you know what I'm saying, your kid being outside, getting snatched up by somebody, or, you know what I'm saying, getting into a fight and getting shot. You know what I'm saying? Just anything, getting robbed. Back in the day, like, we still had that, but it really wasn't, you know what I'm saying? Like, for for some odd reason, like we knew how to handle ourselves, you know what I'm saying? Like it was like we were we were like super mature enough to be able to be outside and be in those situations and still, you know what I'm saying, be children at the same time. And I think that's was uh, I think that's what's unique about our generation. You know what I'm saying? Like even though I know this was um, this came out in 1991, you know what I'm saying? As I got older, like. I was able to take a lot of that stuff that I seen. Well, not just seen in the movie, but because my cousin, a lot of my cousins, um, they were around that age. You know, what I'm saying between the ages of ten and fourteen, in the you know, what I'm saying late eighties. So I grew up with a lot of them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like even the ones that were a little bit closer to me in age, like even they still had, you know, what I'm saying some of that in them as well. So, I mean, this was just like a great reflection of, you know what I'm saying, black youth in that area at the time. And I think it just had a lot of similarities with, you know what I'm saying, others, you know what I'm saying, around the nation. True. 
Understandable. And I think one thing that some people seem to miss about this movie is I think that watching it as an adult, you you understand and you kind of put together that this movie is really about fatherhood. Yeah. You know, so <clears throat> like one of the one of the, the quotes that kind of gets slept on that a lot of people seem to miss because of just how much content and how much um things actually happened in this movie is the one little clip of when when Furious was talking to Trey and he was like, you know, what are the things that you need to do? And so he told him and um, he was just like, dad, what do you do? He was like, yo, I ain't got to do nothing but pay bills, put food on the table and put clothes on your back. And so he was like, I know you think I'm being hard on you, but you know, I'm trying to teach you to be responsible. And he was like, though, he's like, your friends don't have, you know, somebody in their life to do that to them. And yeah. you can see how they're going to turn out. Mm-hmm. So when you see the differences between, even though Trey grew up same neighborhood across the street with these dudes all the time, you see how different Trey was. Yeah, because of the because of the gems that he was getting every day from his father. Mm-hmm. And I think that another message that John was trying to put out there was the fact of look what a mature father can do for you know what I'm saying his black child living in the hood yeah and i think that's something that really gets slept on when it comes to this movie man i agree with you man but and, and not only that you know look at what you know growing up with you know what i'm saying a community could do for you too because it wasn't just you know what i'm saying his father being in the house it was also you know them having the preacher at church and them having that connection, you know what I'm saying? Them having the connection with everybody's mom, you know what I'm saying? It was a sense of family. Like they could go, you could tell they could go over each other's houses and you know what I'm saying? It wasn't no issue. You know what I'm saying? Doing stuff just like spending quality time and chilling on the porch with each other. You know what I mean? Like growing up around, you know what I'm saying? The same people all their lives and being able to have that, you know what I'm saying, that that connection with all those different people in that community. And I think that's, you know what I'm saying, another thing that he added in there was just having that that sense of unity and community in the family, I mean, in the family, in the in the neighborhood, you know, especially around those times growing up. I think that was a very important message he also put in there too. Um, but real quick, for those who don't know, um, quick synopsis of Boys in the Hood. Um, I kind of briefly went over it, but it's basically um, about the lives of uh, three friends growing up in um, South Central L.A. uh, and basically dealing with everything that was going on at the time in L.A. Um, But this movie is starring Cuba Gooding Jr., Lawrence Fishburne, Ice Cube, um, Angela Bassett, um, Morris Chestnut. Um, also, it had, let me see, let me see, let me see. There's some names in here, man. Desi Arnaz Hines the second was in this joint. If you don't know him, he was a little boy in Harlem Nights at the beginning. Um, it had Regina King, Neil Long, uh, Whitman Mayo. For those who don't know him, that's Grady from um, Sanford and Son. And it had... Um, Yo-Yo, you know what I'm saying? Yep. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Form, well, I don't know if she's, well, she don't rap no more. Former female rapper um, of the early 90s as well. So, I mean, this was a, this was a pretty charged up movie, man. Um, and Vontae Sweet was in this too. The dude that played, um, he was, um, What is dude's name in Minister Society? Raheem? It ain't Raheem. It's um Hold on. I'm about to Sharif. He plays Sharif in Minister oh, Society. Oh, Sharif. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 oh. Yeah, he yeah. was um he was Sharif in Minister Society. He was also in this. Um let me see. Alyssa Rogers. 
Uh, she played Demita in Class Act. She played Shanice in this movie. So you know what I'm saying? It has some. It has some pretty familiar faces. Um, in this joint around the time, man. So um, watching this right as an adult, how do you feel about this movie now? I think as an adult. I feel that this was a movie that is very necessary. Mm -hmm. Um, I know one thing I remember talking to Uncle Washington about this and, you know, and I said, the, the you know, the term hood classic He's like, it's, it's not a hood classic. He was like, you know, it's, it was like, it's a classic. It's, it's a message movie. Yeah. Even though Uncle Washington is on the, you know, he was on the whole thing of like, don't show, you know, white folks are ugliness. Yeah. But like the way that they put it in this movie, it's not really showing you ugliness. It's showing you this is what life is like when I look out the door. Like mm -hmm. these are the issues that we deal with on the day to day basis. Like mm -hmm. and when John decided to put these messages in there, like think about it. When is the first time now maybe it could be different for you, but like for me, this is the first time I've heard the term or even the word gentrification. Yeah. I've never heard that word like growing up or you know, somebody speaking to me about it. Yeah. And for it to be a scene where he's outside, you know, speaking to his son his son's best friend and then just a you know not a whole crowd but you know a crowd of people start coming up and he starts teaching these people about gentrification and talking to them about why is there a gun store on every corner why is there a um liquor store liquor store on every mm -hmm. corner he was like they want them they want us to um eliminate ourselves you know what mm -hmm. i'm saying and he was just saying like it and to put that type of stuff in a movie in the mix of showing you the violence, but at the same time, trying to explain the violence at the same time. Right. Like, there is a there's a method to the madness. Mm -hmm. And also putting in there like, yo, we don't own no ships. We don't own no planes. Like, how is that shit getting in here? Right. So I think that John did it in the most perfect way. And like, some people, I've heard people say that John kind of screwed up with this being his first movie because a lot of people felt that it was his best movie and he mm -hmm. never could really top it again. But I just think that this movie, like, and I think that this is why he was so headstrong on getting Ice Cube. And there's a backstory with that I want to get into after we, you know, finish this little segment up here. Okay. But, like, I think that it was it was perfect to have somebody like Ice Cube because him coming off of the whole NWA thing and how the government went after NWA for their lyrics, and they're like, yo, this is what we see. Mm -hmm. Like, when we go outside, this is the life that we see. So we're not doing gangster rap. We're just telling you the realities of our lives. Uh -huh. And that's what John did. And I think that he chose Ice Cube, Ice Cube perfectly because he knew that he would fit this mold the best. So I'm going to throw the question back to you, man, uh, watching it as an adult. Um, watching it as an adult now, right? Being able to look back, you know what I'm saying, and, and reflect. I... I kind of, I kind of, um, I kind of got a, a better, um, I kind of got a better appreciation for John Singleton. And with that, um, I'm trying to think of a better way to put this. Yeah, I, I keep it there. I had a better appreciation of John Singleton, right? Because what I thought about during this time, especially around the time this movie came out, early 90s, late 80s, 
you had somebody else that was doing these type of movies as well, right? But instead of doing that on the West Coast, we had somebody doing it on the East Coast. Now, Spike Lee, he was also telling the story about young black lives in New York. You know what I'm saying? So on one side of the on one side of the country, you got Spike Lee. On another side of the country, you got a guy like John Singleton. And they were in that same vein of making these movies that was um that was telling you the stories of young black adulthood. You know what I'm saying? Like whether it was um John Singleton did higher learning too, right? Yep. Yeah, so like you know, you got higher learning, you know what I'm saying? You got school days from Spike Lee, you got boys in the hood, you know what I'm saying? You got do the right thing with Spike Lee. Like you have these movies that's showing you, you know what I'm saying, what it's like to be young and black in these major cities, but also you can start to see the similarities that each of these groups of people are going through. And with Boys in the Hood, it's it was a little different because in the midst of everything happening and, you know what I'm saying, with, with everything that was going on in this movie, it touched on so many different topics. It touched on race. It touched on, you know what I'm saying, the violence. It touched on, you know, relationships between young black people around this time. You know what I'm saying? The You know, it, it touched on the culture of young black people around this time, you know, and then not only that with, with it being in uh, South central, it touched on the gangs of that time as well, too. Cause now you got, you know what I'm saying? A lot of different shit going on and there's so many venues and, and ways to go that they're touching on all, you know, he was able to touch on all of these topics within this movie and kind of combine it into like this, this gumbo of a message. And Dude, uh, teen pregnancy. That yeah, for sure, for sure. Teen pregnancy, yeah, like so you know, and then you gotta remember too, like even not even just that, just the fact of you know what I'm saying, Ricky having a football scholarship, you know what I'm saying, seeing how he was treated amongst people, you know what I'm saying, how he was revered amongst people because he was going to college to play football. So, like, you know what I'm saying, it brought so many aspects, like even with, with Doughboy, like how how Doughboy was treated, you know what I'm saying, amongst the community. Um, how Trey was treated, you know what I'm saying? Like, even though he was still in the mix of certain shit, like, he came from a two-parent household. You know what I mean? Like, even though he didn't necessarily live with both parents, just in general, like, he had both of his parents. You know what I'm saying? True, true. Um, So, one thing I wanted to touch on, I I thought that the... um, the casting of Ice Cube for people who never heard the story, like this was a long time coming. Mm-hmm. Um, John was going to USC, USC film school and ran into Ice Cube. Uh, I think it was either that stage or something like that. Uh, when he was with NWA, it was like, yo, I got this movie that I want to do. I want to cast you in it. So he asked him who he was. He was like, yo, I'm John Singleton. Um, I'm still in film school right now, but I got this idea for a movie. He was like, kind of brushed him off. So he ended up finishing film school and run. And I think at this point he had left NWA, ran into um, John Singleton again. Yeah. So somehow Ice Cube ended up needing a ride. And John Singleton ended up giving him a ride. It was like, yo, mm-hmm. do you remember me? He was like, nah. He was like, remember I asked you like a year ago, two years ago, like, yo, I got this movie in mind that I want to do and I want to cast you in it. So he was like, oh, you know, yeah, I remember you, but you know, he kind of brushed it off. He was like, okay, well, it's been a year or two. You still ain't done nothing. So, you know what I mean? So he just thought it was bullshit. Yeah. So what ended up happening then was he ended up getting a phone call from John. It was like, yo, like I got the movie green, green lit and I want to cast you in the movie. So he told him he wanted him to play Doughboy. And so John had boys in the hood in his mind when he was still in college. And the whole time 
one thing that he knew, even though this dude had no acting experience, he never been seen in a movie. Like, yeah, he was seen in a video, but you know, being in the video at that time was an actor. So he just knew that he wanted Ice Cube, and I think that the reason he wanted Ice Cube because he knew that he can get an authentic person to do it. Because if he's rapping the things that he's rapping in songs like you know, what I'm saying Boys in the Hood and and all types of shit like that. Um, he's like, yo, he will understand the message that I'm trying to send through this movie better than anybody will. So yeah. the casting of Ice Cube being an unproven actor, being, you know, I think he was 19, 20 years old, maybe nine, maybe 21, maybe um, in 1991. So having a young dude like him, even though he's not the main, main character, the main character is Cuba Gooding Jr., but mm-hmm. I just thought that him picking Ice Cube, but, but also John Singer to have a, a history of bringing rappers in movies. Um, he's very big into that. Uh, you know, you think about Poetic Justice, him bringing Tupac in, but Tupac was, Tupac was really an actor, though. Like, he, he really went to school for this shit, so, like, Tupac was really, he was really an actor before he was a rapper. Um, yeah, I mean, he went to theater school. Yeah, so he was really into that before he really started rapping. So, but I just, you know, for the people who didn't know the story, like I, you know, I don't, I mean, look, I'm going <laughs> out the dome right now. It was some more other stuff that went along with it, but but John had it in his mind and he had it set that he wanted Ice Cube for sure with the, uh, to be the person to play Doughboy. Yeah. And <clears throat> before I, we get into Doughboy, though, like, I want to start with Miss Baker, man, because I think that this is another thing that look, we both black, so I can't speak for white people, but mm-hmm. I think that one thing that that seems to happen in the black community is if there's a situation where there are two kids or you know multiple kids, whatever the case may be, and they have different fathers, mm-hmm. and there is a thing where there is favoritism towards the child. And right. this was clearly displayed in this movie. Um, I think for movie watchers like us, like we've probably seen it right off the rip. I don't know if, if mm-hmm. I really saw it as a kid, but you know, being like a teenager and stuff like that, like you know, you kind of pick up on it, you start to notice things. So she showed a favoritism towards Ricky, and and it's very clear that I don't know what happened to Ricky's dad, but apparently. She did not fuck with Doughboy's dad. Mm-hmm. And a result of that, she treated him different. She always showed favoritism to a Ricky. And what that could also stuff? mean that that nigga was going to college to play football, too. Nah, but no, she did it even <laughs> when I was a kid, saying. though. I like, know I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, like she, like, she did it even when he was a kid. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, even, and even Doughboy even recognized it. Like, as a kid, like, yo, like, why are you, you know, treating me different than Ricky? And, but I think that that is a thing that ends up happening, um, you know, in the black community where, you know, either absent father or whatever the case may be, and you look at that child and all you can think about is that child's father and what that father must have done to them. And mm-hmm. I thought that bringing that also into this film, like, I think that John really touched on like a lot of topics. Um, he really touched on a lot of shit in a movie that is an hour and fifty two minutes. Like, you know, for him to put that in there and for for it to be displayed the way that it was displayed, and she played the character that she played. Like, I think that she was very necessary for what she was doing. Um, like, I, I think she had love for Doughboy, but it wasn't. It wasn't the same for Ricky, and yeah, it, it was just ah oh man. What 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 are your thoughts on it, man? Because I'm starting to ramble a little bit. So for me, um, I agree with you, man. I, I think that what um what John did, and um, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I, I want to say a subconscious way, right? Like you, I, I know he meant to do it, of course, but I don't think that people realized that it was going on. Um, but what he did was he had did a great job of showcasing the traumas 
of growing up, you know what I'm saying, in these neighborhoods around this time as well. You know, with everything going on, you know, with, you know, the drug, ep- <clears throat> the drug epidemic, you know, young men getting locked up around this time, you know, it, it seemed as if, you know, the, the cards were stacked against us, you know what I'm saying, especially around this time. And so, you know, her dealing with, um, you know what I'm saying, the son of a man who she probably didn't have the greatest relationship with, you know, and we don't really know what her childhood was like and what her upbringing was like. So, of course, you know, her having to raise two two kids on her own, you know, trying to make sure that she can feed them and house them and clothe them and stuff like that. You know, that it's a lot of stress that goes into that. And then, you know, you add in the fact that you don't have the best relationship with, you know, saying this child's father and you may or may not have the best relationship with the other child's father. Um, me being a product of that myself, not necessarily the, the favoritism thing, but, you know, me and my sister have different dads. So I I can, you know what I'm saying, in a sense, relate to it. Not necessarily like the whole favoritism thing, because it was never like no favoritism. Um, we both got the, you know what I'm saying, of course, equal amounts of love that we deserve. But, you know, just seeing that, I've seen that happen in, in my family before to where like one child is praised and loved and showered, you know what I'm saying, and everything else. And then the other child is kind of like, you know what I'm saying, backed off or backed off of or whatever. And then also me being, you know what I'm saying, a father myself, having, you know what I'm saying, a stepdaughter and, and everything else, like that was, you know what I'm saying, something that I never tried to do and always was, you know what I'm saying, consciously aware of. So seeing that in the movie, um and you know what I'm saying and noticing that, like you said, it was it's something quick that you notice. Um it's kind of like blatant, honestly, you know. Yeah, she kind of looked at Doughboy as a failure before he even got a chance to even prove himself to be anything. And then, you know, Ricky, of course, being showered with love and affection and everything else, you seen what he was able to grow to be. And then, you know, with Doughboy, you seen that he was, you know, he kind of was put in, in a lane where he had to kind of, you know what I'm saying, raise himself. Even though he had a mother at home, he still was, you know what I'm saying, in a in a sense he had to raise himself and also raise his little brother. And the weird part about it at all is that it's ironic that Ricky was the one that ended up dying from, you know what I'm saying, gun violence. <laughs> and Doughboy, you know what I'm saying, was living. Yeah, and, and I think that he made a point of doing that because yeah. um like another scene that sticks out when it comes to them is, you know, when, when Ricky got taken out now, mm-hmm. granted they had just got into a fight, but the thing is they brothers, we, we, I'm pretty sure she's seen them tussle. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Growing up, that's just what you do. You have a little disagreement. Y'all rough each other. Up. That wasn't yeah. really fighting in the yard. Like, like they were really wrestling. It wasn't, it wasn't really like, you know what I mean? Straight up that's fighting. What bro- when you close in that age, man, that's what brothers do. Yeah. And like for her to go out there is, Smack him, smack Doughboy. It's like, what? Like, you know, like you, you see it. He's like, yo, what you smack me for? Like, because mm-hmm. he's like, yo, like, we, yeah, we, we tussling, but we ain't really, you know what I'm saying? This ain't no real well, at beef. At the same like, time, once again, man, you forget this nigga had a scholarship, man. You can't be re- you can't be tussling with that nigga, man. <laughs> <laughs> <He's> <laughs> tears ACL, man. True, true, but like for him, for for her to do that so blatantly, and then for Ricky to, you know, to die the way that he died. Yeah, and then for him to bring him home and like, I think that she didn't allow Doughboy to mourn. Like, all he wanted was like when he got that hug from his mama. Like he'd been wanting that hug for a long time, Mm -hmm. and for her to give it to him for a second and then realize, and then she goes back to, "Oh, you did this," and then for her to start hitting him and say that you did this, like. I think that he was he was like he just lost his brother. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like this was a person that you know that like they joked around and all this type of shit. I mean, he, like he basically raised him. 
Yeah, and he that like, was like he was losing. I mean, not only was it like, and I mean to cut you off, but like, not only was it like losing his brother, shit, it was like losing his son too. Yeah, because like he always protected him, like the whole yeah. scene of when the dude took his football. Yep, and he's like, nah, fuck that. Like I'm gonna go up to this dude that's about five, six years older than me, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna get my brother's football back. Cause and even Trey was like, yo, I give you my football. He's like, nah, he's not gonna want it. He said his daddy gave him that football. Mm-hmm. So like he knew Ricky, he loved Ricky. Like he would have done anything for Ricky. Like he went up to a straight teenager when he's fat and chubby, knowing he couldn't beat him. Right. And he was like, yo, like I have to get my brother's football back. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for for him to be mourning in that moment and, you know, and she gives him a little bit and then just blame him for it. And then like when he tried to take the baby away, yo, the baby don't need to be seeing this. Mm-hmm. And then she's like, don't you touch him? Don't you ever touch him? And he's like, yeah, yeah, y- y'all could be mad. I understand that. But like. A baby really don't need to be seeing that either. Like, and then that's the that's the crazy part. Like even even that, like you know, what I'm saying Ricky having a kid. You know what I'm saying? Like with with everything that he had, you know, what I'm saying out of love and everything that he had with him, he still wasn't in. You know what I'm saying? Like the best position. You know what I mean? Like Doughboy didn't have no kids. Doughboy had a car. You know what I'm saying? Like you could tell like he was a lot more mature than he was supposed to be. You know what I mean? mean, He talked about like, yo, and that's one of the funniest scenes too that I slept on is when they was playing domino when he got it for his party. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so uh, Trey was like, yo, how you get so big? He was like, man, you know, you know, pumping weight and and eating. He was like, yo, but he's like, you know, I spent a lot of time in there reading books. He was Mm -hmm. like reading, he was like, <laughs> he, said, he said, I can't read, nigga. He said, I ain't no criminal. <laughs> he said, I can't read, bitch. Yeah. And that shit was so funny. But, but you know, he was in there. At, and see, and that's the thing that he always do with Ice Cube. Mm-hmm. You think about Ice Cube and high learning. He's the always, same thing. He's always an intellectual. Yeah. He's always mm-hmm. the dude that reads a lot. And he learns a lot. And I think that Doughboy was really just a product of his environment. Like, he was just, like, for him going in and out of juvie, you know, for the first time, just, you know, stealing some shit. And, but I just felt that that, that the way that she treated Ricky and, but at the same time, for Ricky to have a friend like Trey, because at that moment, like, dude, hold on, let me ask you this. You're a little Mm -hmm. bit younger than me. So I don't know. Do you remember that army commercial? Dude, I used to see that commercial all the time with Ricky. The B-R-U-B B-R-U-B commercial? Yeah. Yeah. They ran that commercial, I know, for about 10 years before they finally changed it up. Yo, That's that true. commercial, it used to come on all the time. And for Ricky to look at it and strongly consider it, because I think that Ricky didn't have confidence that he actually got the grade that he needed to get mm-hmm. on the SAT. And you know what I'm saying? But also, man, I got to appreciate somebody like you, you know what I'm saying, going over to Ricky's house, you know what I'm saying, being the, uh, the SC guy and trying to get him to come to the school, you know what I'm saying? Um, I don't know how you was able to age back in 1991 to try to get Ricky to go into USC. Yo, I know to- <laughs> oh, man, that's hilarious. Hey. Hey, I looked amazed. at him. I was like, "Yo, but that ain't school's brother right there, but <laughs> hey, I ain't gonna lie, man. Hey, you got to do what you got to do, brother. Yeah, but that was funny, that was funny. Like, and I never thought about that until I looked at it the other day. I was like, I wish that was me, though. I ain't gonna lie to you. I really wish I could go back in time and play that part, man. You know how much money I'd be having right now." Oh yeah, for sure, man. Like the, those checks that that be rolling in. Yeah, man, I'd be on top of the world right now, man. Especially with a movie like this. Like this movie was so dope because, you know, what I'm saying, like it started a lot of different, you know, what I'm saying, careers. Like even though Regina King was in Two Two Seven, like you know, her being in this, you know, what I'm saying that gave her an edge. You know, what I'm saying like Nia alone, like this started her relationship with Ice Cube. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Later on, they would do Friday. <clears throat> After that, they would do Are We There Yet? Um, Morris Chestnut, Neil Long. They was in, you know, they was in, um, what's that movie? Was it Best Man? 
Yep, Best Man. Yeah, they was in Best Man. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, and Regina King was in um. Well, she got Ice Cube too. She was his sister in Friday, but also yep. she was in Poetic Justice. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm she had a bigger role in pro and poetic justice for sure, but that's what I'm saying. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, this movie not only, um, and you know, this movie not only helped launch their careers, but I mean, it helped as a, a, a huge stepping stone. But that's another similarity with Spike Lee and John Singleton, also, uh, also is that you know, what I'm saying he, he used a lot of the same actors and actresses in a lot of his movies the same way Spike would do, um. And I and and that's why I said, man, to have those two at this time, you know, with with the the creativity that they brought to the screen, it was so dope to be able to live in this time and see these movies as they were coming out, and you know what I'm saying, just having that cut that type of energy in the air of. You know, you got somebody on the West Coast telling that story. You got somebody on the East Coast telling that story. And, you know what I'm saying, you just felt like you was represented all the way around. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? We, like, even though, you know, growing up, I know that, represent. you know, they like, now it's a big thing where they talking about how representation matters. Like, growing up in the, in the 90s, like, I've never felt like representation never mattered. You know what I'm saying? Didn't matter. But at the same time, I also felt like we were represented. You know what I'm saying? Like we had so many, like, even if you think about it now, the movies that they talk about that's classics are movies that came out, you know what I'm saying? In that time of the nineties, you know what I'm saying? Like in that time of us growing up and, and being able to relate to a lot of this stuff. And, and I think that is dope that these two gentlemen, you know, kind of were on the back end of all this and really, you know what I'm saying? Well, I'm sorry, not the back end, but on the forefront of all this, you know what I'm saying, putting this stuff out and, and giving us this type of look into the lives of people in, you know what I'm saying, in those areas. And then the crazy part about all of this is that a year later, we have the, you know what I'm saying, the riots in Watts. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's so, 92. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, not only did you get, you know what I'm saying, not only did America get a glimpse of what was going on, you kind of had that understanding of why it was going on the way it was. You know what I'm saying? Because not only did John Singleton give you so much, you know what I'm saying, about how people were living in these areas, you know, in real life, you seen like the shit that happened to Trey and at, at the uh, police stop. So, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like him coming home, swinging at the air, you know what I'm saying? Talking to Neil Long and, you know, letting her know, like, yo, I, you know, can't believe it. I can't believe this type of shit is happening. But as we can see a year later, this is the same thing that happens. You know what I'm saying? They kill a young man. And next thing you know, a police stop turns into a murder. And, you know what I'm saying? The whole, you know what I'm saying? City of LA goes up in flames. So, you know what I'm saying? I, I thought it was dope for him to be able to put this out and, have kind of foreshadowed the the problems that were going on and seeing how they they were going um untreated what eventually ended up happening and then like i say he picked ice cube purposely yeah when you think about um and it, and it made think, even more sense because that's where cube was from yeah, and you also got to think about the song Fuck the Police, black cop showing out for the white cop. Yep. That black cop was always the one mm -hmm. that was, you know what I'm saying, saying unappropriate shit, and he was always he was the one that was that self-hate type thing mm -hmm. where he treated the black suspects worse than he would treat anybody. Yeah. You know, like when the whole situation of um, Fury's house being broken into, he was like, you know, so I wish you would have got him, just another nigga off the streets. And then, like, when with the police stop, when he had the gun on him, he was like, man, you look like one of those, you know what I'm saying, gang members, nah, 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 he had the gun to his head and all that type shit. So it was always, he was always showing you, like, yo, all, kin, all skin folk ain't kin folk. Facts. You know what I'm saying? He's showing this to you in 1991. So John, um, he had a vision, man. He was a visionary, so he had a lot of that shit ready. 
Um, and then also when you think about somebody like Ricky, like how many Ricky, like everybody have a Ricky in their, in their neighborhood. It was yeah. always that one athlete that was like, yo, like that's going to be the guy. That's going to be the guy. Mm -hmm. And then stray bullet or whatever the case. Or wrong be. time, wrong place. Exactly. Like there are so many athletes and even, even, you know, when you listen to something like all the smoke, Mm -hmm. Or even even the Knuckleheads podcast, like mm -hmm. that, like they'll tell you, like, like yo, it was just one dude from my hometown, like he busted all our ass, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Whether it was drugs or whether it was the gang, whether it was um, being a gang member or or just being at the wrong place, wrong time, mm -hmm. and they just excuse me, and they just never made it. So I think of putting that story in there of a guy. It was heading the USC, but then also the disappointment that you get as, as a mother of knowing he needed a 700 and he got a 17. Yeah. You know, just to know. Like, because that's one of those situations where I don't even want to know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't, I'm just going to assume that he didn't get the grade that he needed. You know what I'm saying? Okay, but, I got to know. But the just to know. That, to kill me. I, I got to know, man. Yeah. And, and But it's just the fact of like, them actually putting that in the script to be like, he would have went to USC and he mm -hmm. would have, you know, gone there on a full scholarship, all that type mm -hmm. of shit. So, yeah, man, that there are there are a lot of. Uh, I mean, shit. Man. That remember that almost happened to Allen Iverson. Yeah, and, and he you know went to jail. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He got sentenced. I mean, they threw the book at Allen Iverson. Yeah, and if it wasn't for the community, nothing. yeah, yeah, like I mean, from from now. This is the thing. From the accounts of the people there, they was like, yo, when all the fighting started and they showed the video, they're like, look, that's Allen right there walking. Like, Allen was walking out. But Allen broke down on Stephen A's old show mm -hmm. back in the day. Uh, man, I forget what the name. I think it was Quite Frankly. Yep. And Allen Iverson was up there crying like, yo, I deserve for what happened to me to happen to me. And he was just like, you know, and he and he really broke down. But I think what Allen was saying was, you know, maybe I said something, or you know, for him being there, just wrong place, maybe, wrong time. Yeah, I think you know, it might have just is he been technically. Just, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that maybe he was just saying like. Maybe I shouldn't have been there. I mean, even though it was a bowling alley, mm -hmm. maybe even though it was a bowling alley, but you know, maybe it was a situation where he was like, "Yo, like I know a lot of white people go here. Something could happen." Like, well, not, I, I don't not know. even that. Not even that. Like you got to remember, like at this time, you know, he's the he's the, the the hottest thing in the area. You know, everybody knows who he is. You know what I'm saying? So him being there with his friends, you know what I mean. In in that environment, they high school kids, they out, they kicking it, you know, they having fun, they doing shit high school kids do. And, you know, this is the closest thing these people are seeing to a celebrity. So being able to, you know what I'm saying, not being able to really get that kind of access, you know, they, of course, you're going to feel away. And, you know, really, it's not, it's not their fault, it's the fault of the people around them, like, bro. Like he he bowling man, let the man bowl. You know what I'm saying? He got enough shit on his mind. He got he got to worry about dropping 51 points on the next team. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then he got to worry about going to class the next day and passing the test. Like, so I don't I think <clears throat> in in those circumstances, like people really don't understand the stresses. You know what I'm saying? That these student athletes like, you know the whole gang thing like in the in the in the one thing that i wish he really would have showed was um how the gangs used to protect people like ricky mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like growing up like like you said we all know that one dude that was super good at sports but when you had those dudes that was gang members or drug dealers or whatever like they never, they never messed with those type of dudes. They always made sure those dudes was okay because they knew that, you know, what I'm saying those dudes had a, had a chance to get out. They knew that those dudes could possibly come back and make everything okay. And 
you know what I'm saying? You, usually a lot of times, like, the drug dealers and the, and the gang members would be the dudes that's telling, you know what I'm saying, that dude, hey, man, listen, you know, when you get out of here, bro, don't forget about us. You know what I'm saying? Come back in and, you know what I'm saying, lend a hand out and, and help people out. You know what I'm saying? Because these people need it. And and that's the, you know, that's the one thing I liked about the black exploitation films was because even though, you know, it was always, you know what I'm saying, they, they might have been a vigilante or they might have been a pimp or it might have been a drug dealer or some shit like that. Like they always had some type of righteous message, you know what I'm saying, in the movie at the end of the day. Like if you ever watch the Mac, it's a scene in the Mac where Goldie is walking back to his Cadillac, right? And as he's walking back to his Cadillac, I think I told this story before, but I'll tell it again. But as he's walking back to his Cadillac, you see all these kids rush up to him. And when the kids rush up to him, they cut to a scene where it's two women standing at the bus stop. And while they're standing at the bus stop, they're talking about him like he ain't nothing but a no good pimp, a two bit pusher. You know what I'm saying? Like they just dogging him. But what he's doing as the kids, you know, when they cut back to him, He's talking to the kids and giving them money. He's handing the money out. And he asking them, did they go to school today? And one kid, they was like, you know, he said, yeah, I went to school. And everybody else was like, no, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. And he didn't get a kid no money. He was like, hey, he said, you go to, you know what I'm saying? You go back to, you know, you're supposed to be in school, man. What I tell you? And then he said, you know what I'm saying? You go to school tomorrow, come back. You get the rest of your money. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was people like that that. We had to kind of lean, especially in, in those times, we had to kind of lean on not to just be protection for the neighborhood, but also to kind of guide, you know what I'm saying, the youth outside of, you know what I'm saying, their parents and outside of, you know what I'm saying, their grandparents and their family. Because even though they were out doing what they were doing, they still was trying to make sure that those kids didn't end up like them or those kids didn't end up. In, in the situations that they were seeing and they really cared about their community. And even though, you know, so like a lot of gang members and stuff was doing some shit they, you know what I'm saying, shouldn't have been doing, they still kind of gave a fuck about their community and they still kind of cared about their community. You know what I'm saying? And eventually, like a year later after, you know what I'm saying, this movie came out, we also had, you know what I'm saying, the gang truce. You know what I'm saying? So it's like it's a lot of it's a lot of different things, you know what I'm saying, that I wish he'd have added in. I know he couldn't add it in the game truce, of course, but I just thought it was, you know what I'm saying, it was something that he should have added in with, you know what I'm saying, those guys being the guys that still kind of protected Ricky in a sense. Like looking out for him and, and something like that. I wish he would have really added that in there. <clears throat> I feel you, I feel you, but like you said, like he couldn't he couldn't put everything right because um, he put a lot there. in there. Yeah, he put a lot in there, and, and he touched a lot of topics. But, um, but the end on Ricky though, like I felt that. Now we also got to understand Ricky's like seventeen, eighteen years old. Mm-hmm. I think he was a little naive to notice that his mom showed favoritism toward him. I mean, he probably didn't. That's something that probably didn't even cross his mind. Because you got a whole like, like even <laughs> what well, like what started the whole fight. Like he asked him to run into the store. He's like, Nah, your wife wants you to run to the store. Like your dad, my wife. You're like, it might as well be. Like I got a whole family in the house. Like, mm-hmm. moms will let me have no mom, you know what I'm saying, in-house pussy. So I just think that Ricky didn't really understand, like, how far and beyond his mother was going for him mm-hmm. that she wasn't doing for Doughboy. Hey, Ricky was kind of a dirtbag if you think about it, though. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Like, j- just to – and then, like, I, I, that's what I'm saying. Like, he had to be naive to it. Like, I don't think he really understood. Like, No, he was just really a spoiled little bitch. He was. She spoiled him the whole time. Yeah. Like, the whole time. Like, he never had to really go through anything. And then, like, with Doughboy being in and out of juvie and all that type shit, like, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then he was able to expose himself to different things. Yeah. But also, what that also showed was with Doughboy being an intellectual and then Ricky being, you know what I'm saying, the athlete, you know, two, 2.3 GPA mm-hmm. and you know, I look, dude. Let me tell you something. You can tell how things changed from 1991 and 2004. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? I graduated with a 2.5 GPA. They told mm-hmm. me I needed a 1250 on my SAT. They told Dang. Ricky he needed a 700. Like, Dang. like, God damn, man! Why, why, why I can't just get a 700? If I was a 700, man, I would have been probably at North Carolina State or some shit. Oh, but um, sure. I graduated but, with like um, a three something though. 
Man, I was in. Listen, I was a nerd though. Let's see, I was on the debate team. Man, listen, I was in there, and dude, I, I don't know what I, I think. I don't know if it was just the fact of just, you know, always got practice and working on the weekends, dude. I I, I slept like pretty much all through high school. Like yeah, that was just nigga, where I, I went to go to sleep. Like you go from football it, practice to work. Like it was just like yeah, man. It was like I was always sleeping, man. I just slept yeah. all Maybe my lessons. You was like, a you was a dad before you was a dad, bro. That's what dad was <laughs> going to. <laughs> Nigga, you was a you was a uh, a seventies NFL player, bro. Yo, I mean, it wasn't. I mean, look, I worked on the weekends. <laughs> now I'm just talking saying, shit. But... I'm just saying, like, you yeah. niggas would play a game and then like leave and <laughs> go straight to the meal, bro. That you was yeah. So yeah, I get it. Man. Yeah, it was it was crazy. It was crazy. I'm surprised but yeah. you, you ain't start drinking early. Man, listen, man. I, I just always handle shit different. Like I know I was telling somebody the other day, I was like, yo, like 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 my well my sophomore year, I worked second shift on the weekend. I used to work three to eleven. And then they changed the rule <laughs> to where well they changed the law and said that kids that are in high school can't work you can after work ten o'clock. Time. So then I start working three to ten. So mm-hmm. then I was real cool with my GM. So like around my junior and my senior year, I was like, yo, can I work the first shift? So I started working seven o'clock in the morning to three. Yeah. So like I would play a game Friday night and where everybody would, you know, go out after the game. I'd be like, yo, I'm going home. Yeah, you gotta go to work. I gotta go <laughs> to work. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, but I gotta be at work at seven o'clock in the morning. I bro. told you, bro, you was a full life dad, bro. Hey, but I had I had to pay my own car insurance, man. I had to pay my own cell phone bill. But see, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you the dope thing about that though, because I didn't I didn't have a job in high school. But the dope thing about that, bro, is you learn so many lessons and so many, you know, what I'm saying of those adult things early on in life. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying, and you didn't have to worry about whether or not you know what i'm saying later on down the line you didn't have to worry about you know what i'm saying learning how to pay a bill or learning how to do this or learning how to do that you got to learn all that early you know what i'm saying that's one of the dope things about it like you actually had a chance to you was learning how to be an adult you know what i'm saying before you got to that stage and then also and we'll get back to the movie where people got to understand like people my age like when I had to pay my car insurance, like I had to go to State Farm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't no you pick up my phone to pay mm-hmm. my bill. No, I had, I had to build go to nigga. the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah building. I, yeah, I had to go to the damn. I had a I had a Sprint phone. I had to you go, had to, go to, to the Sprint money place. order. You had to go and get a money pay, order. Yeah, and pay it. Pay them. Take that motherfucker there. Yes, yeah, sir. Exactly. So yeah, man. So yeah, I, I had a lot of that stuff early on, man. So Ricky, Ricky didn't understand, and he was going. I'm not going to – I was about to say something. It's it's not a cop-out, but he was going to do the same thing Furious did. And that's another thing, Um, you know, with Furious having those conversations with Trey when they was fishing. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yo, like I had you, you know, well, your mama had you. I was 17. And he was like, you know, I wanted to be something. So I thought going to the Army was, you know what I'm saying, would be something that I could have something for you to look up to. Yeah. And with Furious experiencing that for himself, experiencing the racism and experiencing the things um, that go along with war, he's able to tell Trey, like, yo, don't never go to the army. Mm-hmm. And Trey's able to take that information that he got from his dad to tell Ricky the same thing, like, yo, mm-hmm. that's not what you want. Like, don't do that shit. <laughs> so for you to see the the lessons that this dude is getting from his father, for him to you know what I'm saying? Pass on that message on to his best friend to say, like, yo, think of another way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I understand you got a child. I understand you need to pay for this child. But first of all, let's slow down, pump the brakes. Let's wait to see if you pass the SAT first mm-hmm. before we thinking about going to the Army. Now, I get Ricky trying to have a backup plan, but unless you're in, in that situation of you kind of find – like not being like the father in like because like the thing about war you're not guaranteed to come home you know what i'm saying so yeah. you also have to live with that with that um with that thing in the back of your head of like if i join and we go to war i might not come back yeah my family gonna be yeah. good yeah but my child ain't gonna yeah. have me being a father so that's mm-hmm. something that you have to think about going into it and then not only that, like even if even if you know you 
as far as coming back, like you may, it, it may not even be you just getting killed. It may just be the fact that, you know what I'm saying? You may be stationed somewhere for some, some time and now you got to stay out there because you are at war, you know what I'm saying? Or you are on alert and stuff like that. Like I remember growing up, my uncle, he was, um, he was in the military for over 20 years. And I think either this year or next year, he'll be able to re- like officially retire. But like, I remember being a kid, bro. Like, and we would only, I would only see him like maybe once every, maybe like once every, uh, I don't even want to say every other, maybe every other, other Thanksgiving. You know what I'm saying? Like I can, I can kind of handful of times. I remember him actually being home, you know what I'm saying? Like being back here in the States. So like, I mean, yeah, in, in Ohio. So like, and, and you know what I'm saying, just him even really being in the country, you know what I'm saying? Like he was a part yeah. of Desert Storm and, you know what I'm saying, all these other places. Like when, when the war in Afghanistan happened, like he was there, you know what I'm saying? Like I remember he was stationed in Alaska, you know what I'm saying? Like he was in North Carolina and then, you know, he was overseas and in Germany and Russia and, you know what I'm saying, like all these different places. And it was as a kid, you know, you don't really think about it because, like, every time he come home, he bringing me something. But then, like, at the same time, it's like, damn, like, you really wasn't there, though. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, I didn't really get a chance to properly build that, you know what I'm saying, relationship with you. Even though, you know what I'm saying, we had a, we, we, we have a relationship, but it's not like the relationship that I have with my other uncles, you know what I'm saying? Like, cause they was always there. Those were the guys that I was around. So like me being around them and then, you know what I'm saying? Like even when me, you know, me and my other uncle talked to the one that's in the army or yeah, the one that's in the army, like it's an awkward, you know what I'm saying? Like vibe compared to how me and my other uncles are. So it's like, I being in that is totally different. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, that's just me being his nephew. I can imagine me being his child and, you know what I'm saying, not being able to see my dad, you know what I'm saying, not being able to go through that and, and knowing that, you know, he's in, you know, Afghanistan or he's in, you know what I'm saying, Iraq or whatever and not being able to talk to him and see him like I really want to. So, yeah, that's a, that's that's tough. Yeah, it's a huge sacrifice. But at the same time, shout out to all the people that do it. Because sure. I, I was one of the ones sure. who, who couldn't and didn't. Um, but, I you know, went. I mean, I mean, dude, they almost got me. Um, yeah, I was an RTC. I mean, I wasn't that far. It was just more of like they were just hitting me like crazy coming out of high school. Yeah. And, you know what I'm saying, the National Guard hit me. Um, and it was just like, and I'm, you know, I'm at this point where everything ain't gone at this point. And mm-hmm. I'm like, yo, you know what I'm saying? I'm about to go to college. You know what I'm saying? I'm about to play football. He's like, yeah, but you, he's like, you could do your, your training in two weeks, man. We'll pay you while you in college. Yeah. I'm like, you'll do what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you, you'll do what? Yeah. You, you'll yeah. pay me yeah. in college. See, with me, I was going, I think I was going, I was leaving, and I would have been like a E2 or something like that. I just had to take my, I just had to pass the ASVAP, and I did. But I just didn't go. I ain't, I changed my mind. I ain't want to go. But yeah, like I was I was off to the army. But then my uncle my uncle found out and he was like, nah. <laughs> he was like, we're not doing that, my boy. <laughs> he was like, you could do something else. We won't be doing that. So yeah, yeah, I was crazy. Um, but <laughs> not like Furious though, man. I, I love Furious uh, character. He's probably like my favorite character in, in this movie. movie. Um, with him being a business owner with him reading a lot of books, you know, having mm-hmm. to meditate balls. I used to love it. Like my um, my mom's ex-boyfriend back in the day, he used to have those meditate balls mm-hmm. and um, those things are pretty cool. But like just to see those, those father son moments that he had with him, like cutting the hair and he's talking to him. And, and, and I think that another thing that that show was for, for Furious to lay everything out on the table for Trey to never lie to him and, and for him to feel the way that he felt when he lied to his dad about getting some, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? I think that was a testament to Furious because Furious would, you know what I'm saying? Like he left himself open. Like just look how openly he talked to him about sex. Like he just gave him condoms and was like, no matter what a girl say, you know what I'm saying? Wrap it up. So yeah. you could tell the type of conversations that they had over the years. So I thought that that was dope. And the relationship that he had with his, 
with uh with his mother and also let's throw her in there now i've heard someone say that she was you know what i'm saying kind of a dirt bad mom type yeah thing. she just but, dropped my nigga up like i can't take it no more you got to get him well now this is the thing i think that he did that on purpose yeah because he was tired of being it. with her raggedy ass yeah, because he, he, like, and I'm sorry, that's the only time I ever say that about Angela Bassett. Yeah, because he he writ, he written a letter yeah. saying the next time I get in trouble, I gotta stay with my dad. Mm-hmm. That was an unnecessary fight. He didn't have to fight that kid. Like, hey man, hey man, if 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 you had a dad as cool and serious, bro, yeah, he yeah. I think Trey the whole time did it on purpose. I think he mm-hmm. did the whole sad thing to make her feel better. He was mm-hmm. like, when you gonna go pick me up? Like, he never wanted to be picked up. You sure. He was like, yo, I'm trying to stay out here with Pops. And but also that's dope for like, yeah, I get what you said, but it's also dope for that like there there are some women out there who will keep their child from their fathers. Yeah. You know what I'm for sure. And for, for her sure. to be like, yo, I'm gonna put him <laughs> with you, you his father, and you told me before I can't teach him to be a man. Mm-hmm. So um, for Furious to do what he did and, and to do a fucking phenomenal job, he ended up going to fucking Morehouse. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like being in an environment that he was in, hanging around the guys that he was hanging around, mm-hmm. Furious knew like me telling you these life lessons as young as you are, like I know that you're going to take these things in no matter if you're hanging out. Now, Dope, like I said, Dope Boy was in and out, but Chris was still around the neighborhood. Obviously, mm-hmm. Chris had to get shot to where he got paralyzed. Yeah. So he was around him. I'm pretty sure Dookie was around. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously we see that he gravitated more towards Rick because Rick was, was here. Yeah. You know, the whole time. But I think that Furious, man, like I think that his job as a parent is not pointed out enough in this movie. Mm-hmm. And like and also the understanding, like even though you could look at it like a dirt bag move for her dropping them off, but the only thing that I would say that's kind of a dirt bag move is if is her saying, like, yo, I'm gonna go to school and I'm gonna get my shit together. And then when I get my shit together, you can come back and stay with me. And it's kind of like you know, there's a lot of women out here that yeah. was getting their shit together while they was raising their kid, and right. you decided to, you know, drop your kid off with his father and end up getting your shit together, but like what I didn't understand was like this dude is months away from not probably not even months. I don't know how what if if he took his SAT. Yes, and obviously school is about to be over. Yeah. Why do you want him to come stay with you? This kid's about to go to college. But I mean, why are you gonna argue with this with, man about him coming back? With that, I kind of understood. You know what I'm saying? With with everything, like you know, it's. It's just that's that's just the love, man. Man, you waited too late, man. Like he said, I mean, it's like you missed it. Yeah, yeah, but that's just the love. Like you got that, you know. You can't you can't overcome that motherly instinct to have that love. I mean, I feel what you're saying, but it's like, yo, like this kid is about to graduate, and you know he's going to college. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, man, I, I just want to, and then like I say for him. <clears throat> You know, just to be able to have a father, because see, like my father couldn't have these conversations with me where, when they um, when they when they drove out to uh, the Compton to go see him at work, mm-hmm. and he was like, you know, how did that test go? And they was just like, you know, it was all right. And he was like, well, the test is racially biased anyway. He was like, the only thing that's universal is the math. Like my dad don't know no shit like that. Yeah. But like, but for Furious to 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 be able to have that conversation with him and then take him out and have a conversation about gentrification and all of that type shit. And, you know, even Ricky was like, y'all wish Dope Boy was there to hear it because what we all knew was Dope Boy was an intellectual. Like, he, he, I don't, you know, he didn't have no learning disabilities or anything like mm-hmm. that. Like, Dope Boy was just a product of his environment, you know what right. I'm saying? Um, but I think that those were things that Dope Boy knew Mm-hmm. But I think that he felt that I think that what it was was he didn't have the confidence to do something else because I think always being torn down by his mother and yeah. his brother, like being the guy, I think that that was the one thing that he lacked was that yeah. confidence to do something that wasn't against the law. Right. You know what I'm saying? 
So I think that that was one thing that was like it, man. Um, but I'm doing all the talking, man. Your thoughts on Furious and Trey's mother and, and that um, like, that. I mean, like I said, Trey's mother was, you know what I'm saying, in that moment I felt like she was a dirtbag, man. Just the way she handled that situation. Um, because I've I've seen that situation in real life too, to where, you know, somebody just gets dropped off and you like, God damn, like type of parent is that like you don't have no conversation with this motherfucker no nothing like you don't hey you know what i'm saying i want you to take him in and you know what i'm saying do everything else like you know and you just having that communication amongst parents you know what i'm saying me being a parent myself i understand how important that is um but with furious man i, I think that he was very intricate in all of their lives even though you know everybody didn't probably get to where they were supposed to be in life um but to me, that just speaks on, you know what I'm saying, it takes a village. And just the fact that you had somebody, like, even though they didn't have a, you know what I'm saying, their fathers in their lives, the fact that you had a friend who had a father like that. You know what I'm saying? With, with my brother Dre, like, me and him, you know what I'm saying, this is my best friend in the world. You know what I'm saying? And and I would go to his house, and me and his dad, you know, he he would sit us down and talk to us like that. Like, you know, he would break stuff down to us or – you know, his dad used to play video games, so he used to put us on all the cool video games, and he collected, you know what I'm saying, like, um, he collected, like, like horror statues and knives and masks and, you know what I'm saying, like, uh, science fiction stuff. So, like, he would show us all these cool different things, <clears throat> but, you know what I'm saying, like, and then, you know, he would also, like, whenever he would see us sitting outside, he'd come outside and talk to us about, you know what I'm saying, some science fiction stuff, like, He'd be talking to us about Star Wars or Star Trek or, you know what I'm saying, stuff like that. And I could see how, you know what I'm saying, having, uh, you know what I'm saying, having that, in, you know, a father like that in your life can affect you because my brother, like, that's how he is. You know what I'm saying? He's super, now he's super into sci-fi and, you know what I'm saying, like, we sit and talk about Marvel movies or we'll sit and talk about Star Wars or, you know, he'll bring up Terminator and all these other things. And like he point out stuff to me that I don't know about Terminator because that's not something I could recognize. You know what I'm saying? Because I didn't have, you know, what I'm saying the father figure in my life to be able to, you know, show me those certain things. Or, you know, him and his dad used to go shoot guns and stuff like that. Like, you know, what I'm saying it's a lot of stuff that he was able to get in his childhood that I wasn't able to get in mine. And, you know, it's like it's no there's no slight to either one of us it's just the fact that even though i didn't have that i was still have i was still able to have access to that because his dad never kind of you know what i'm saying like if i was to come to his dad and ask his dad a question like his dad never would have been like no nigga i don't know ask your daddy you know what i'm saying like he was he was one of those guys who would sit you down and and talk with you and stuff like that man and i just thought that it was you know i'm saying it was dope for furious to be able to be in you know what i'm saying all of their lives knowing that those are Trey's friends. And and I think that in his head, he knew that if these are going to be my kids' friends, I'm also going to instill those, I'm going to try to instill those values that I instill in Trey in them. That way I know that regardless of the situation, it you know what I'm saying, if he's going to be around them, he's going to be okay and they're going to be okay as well. But I would rather them all be okay together. You know what I'm saying? And I think that was super important with the stuff that they was doing because he didn't have to stop and talk to him and Ricky about gentrification or get him that gym or anything like that. He could have just left it at what it was. You know what I'm saying? But the fact that he did that, I mean, you know, that, that I think that helps, you know what I'm saying? People grow. And, you know, sometimes it's not your parents that teach you the lessons all the time. Sometimes it's somebody else's parents. Sometimes, you know, it's it's your friends and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's why I was going, you know, saying going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, the fact that John Singleton, you know, what I'm saying showed you what community could do for you as well. You know, and I thought that was super important. Yeah, man. And like, you know, but we, we've been speaking about it. Um, but we haven't really zeroed in on it. But man, like when it comes to somebody like Doughboy, um, you know, still in then somebody tried to make a joke out of it one time. They was like, they was like, yo, they was like, Doughboy, you know what I'm saying, stole the candy boy and got seven years. And it's like, mm-hmm. come on, man, y'all ain't paying attention. Like they said that he was in and out. Like he because mm-hmm. when his mom spoke the trade, she was like, you know, 
can you talk to him to, so see if some of you can rub off on him? I'm tired of him going in and out and all this little shit like that. So yeah. <clears throat> so obviously he didn't steal a candy bar and he was in jail. Well, juvie for seven years. Right. But but yeah, like I thought Doughboy Man was was a character. Like I remember when I did a, a podcast on Twenty Eight Minutes or Less where I, I saw a um this thing that they put up and it was like, who was the hardest character? Mm-hmm. And Doughboy was one of the characters. I was like, I don't think Doughboy was a hard character. I was like, did, I, I think felt, I did that one with you, didn't I? Did you do that one with me? Yeah, because I think no, I had I thought Mickey you did the biggest Casino. snake. No, oh, yeah, yeah, that was snake. the biggest snake. Biggest snake. And um, and I was like, I don't think he's necessarily hard. Like he wasn't a pushover, right. but at the same time, like his character wasn't developed to be like a hard character. Like his mm-hmm. character was really more heartfelt if it was anything like yeah you know like he was just really a product of his environment who took up for his brother um he looked at trey as a brother the whole time like Mm -hmm. he was just a dude who just you know what i'm saying he's so dope to get by but at the same time he was really always protecting his brother if you think about it he never like when it came to the uh to the dude you know what i'm saying in the red car like he never went after him Mm-hmm. He just never understood. Like he was like, man, this dude twenty five years old, still fucking with guys our age. Like, why yeah. is he messing with us? Like, like Doughboy never looked for trouble until they killed Rick. So, right. I never looked at him as a hard character. And I think that, you know, he went in the first time for stealing, and probably those other times it was probably more like possession, you know, little shit like that. So, I never thought that his character was really written to be somebody who was portrayed to be like like a hard dude in the hood if anything like i said he was more heartfelt if anything of like being like his brother's keeper and trying to figure out like yo like why my mom treat me like this like Mm -hmm. i want to be loved too and it's just like she just don't really don't really fuck with me like that man what what are your thoughts on doughboy man I mean, you hit the nail on the head, bro. He was a product of his environment. Like, you know, you, you know, you you do the best that you can growing up in the, in those type of situations, and you know, people don't understand the the complexities of that lifestyle or living in those environments. Like, you know, you're doing your best to stay alive. You ain't even, you're not worried about nothing else. You just want to make sure you wake up to see another day in, in some of those situations. And, you know, him going to juvie early, you know, you you know, when you go to, to those places, you get mixed in with the wrong crowds. You know, think think about that, man. Like the fact that we have a place that that where kids <laughs> are basically being put in a jail. Mm-hmm. Not a, not a, a, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's full grown men that can't stand that, that environment. So imagine what it's like being a kid in that environment. You being taken away from your family. Your parent ain't there, or your parents ain't there. People that know you aren't there, and you basically there to fend for yourself as a child. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So like, imagine what that can do to the mind. Imagine what that can do to a kid's psyche. So. With stuff like that, like, I don't think people understand, you know, the 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 trauma that that probably had on him. So when, you know what I'm saying, she was saying, like, he's, he's been in and out. Yeah, he going to be in and out. The nigga went to jail for stealing a candy bar, bro. Yep. Like, can you just think about that? Like, as a grown man, you go in there, you grab a snicker, forget to pay for it, and walk out. And they like, oh, no, nah, you, you going to jail. You'll be like, what the fuck for it, snicker? You know what I'm saying? So like, <laughs> like that would throw you off. So imagine like, you know what I'm saying, going through that as a child. Like, yo, that's traumatizing as fuck. So, yeah, he was, made Chris. That yeah, that was Chris when he was a kid. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, just the fact that, you know what I'm saying, you going you going into a place like that, and you have to, you know what I'm saying, basically, you know, navigate your way through that, and then to come home. You've missed so much, and you know what I'm saying. Because as a kid, you don't you don't realize like, you know what I'm saying. Uh, six months as for a kid could be a year, bro. 
especially yeah. in a place like that. You know what I'm saying? You might have went in and one of your friends died. You might never see this person again. Like, you know what I'm saying? There's so much that can happen in, in that time span of six months. You don't and you know, you don't know what you go through in those situations. So for him to be for him to even be the type of person he was, you know what I'm saying? Like he said, like, yeah, I read. You know what I'm saying? For him to even have that, like, that just lets you know, like, he was he was doing something to kind of combat that. And I thought that was um, I thought that was dope that Singleton had put that in his character, uh, but no, nah, I was I was always fond of Doughboy man. The fact that he was so logical, you know what I'm saying? The the the, the way he was so level headed, you know what I'm saying? Like he kind of grew up a little fast, but at the same time, like he still realized, like yo, I'm still a kid. At the end of the day, I still have to navigate this life as a kid. I'm not a man yet. And so, you know what I'm saying, the, the stuff that he was doing, like, even though, you know, he was kind of like the, the bad boy in the group, he still was, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying, he was other things, you know what I'm saying? He was the logical one in a lot of in a lot of situations. You know, he was the one that was used to certain shit, so he didn't get, you know, frizzled as easy. And then, you know, dealing with that trauma of going to jail and then, you know what I'm saying? Or go, I'm sorry, I keep saying jail, going to juvie. And then also the trauma of, you know what I'm saying, your mom not being there for you like she should. Like, yeah, he had a lot of he had a lot of shit going on, man. Man, that he did, man. And then he got one of like the whole sequence of Rick getting shot, Trey like, yo, meet me at my house in five minutes. And the whole search of them going to go, you know. He dropped Trey out because Trey said, let me out. <clears throat> and then, you know, Doughboy go do what he does. And then that morning, that talk that they had that morning, he was like, yo, like, I know why you got out the car. Like, you don't need, you didn't need to be in the car in the first place. Like, mm-hmm. Doughboy was smart enough to know, like, Trey, this ain't, this ain't you. Exactly. Like, you never should have even been in the car to start with. And, like, mm-hmm. he didn't say this, but I know what he was thinking was, like, I never even should have allowed you to even be in that situation right. because this ain't the lifestyle for you. Like we know like that you love Rick and everything, but you ain't mm-hmm. the type of person to be seeking revenge out. And he, he even told him like, yo, even doing what I did, I don't even know how I feel about it. Right. You know, and for Trey to tell him like, yo, you know what I'm saying? You still got one brother left. And the whole thing of like the, the most memorable line, they don't Just know about any movie. They don't know? show, or they don't care about what's going on in the hood. There you, you know? go. Because he he looks at <clears throat> the news, and and I think that what he was looking for was validation. Like my brothers, I mean, I didn't say, but I mean, for USC had to be at least the top running back in the state mm-hmm. to not even show it on the news. Yeah. That he got murdered. And I think that he felt the way about that. Like, yo, like my brother was was important. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? He was way more important than I was. And <clears throat> and they don't even show it on the news. Like, what right. type of shit is that? And so, you know, if y'all read the captions, he buried Rick the next day. Two mm-hmm. weeks later, he was murdered. And I think what John was trying to show was like, yo, this is a, a and and they even say it. It's a never ending cycle. Yep. Like you kill my boy, my brother, my friend, my cousin, I go kill you. And the next thing you know, they come his mm-hmm. people come back to kill me. It's an endless cycle that keeps going and going and going and going. Mm-hmm. And also in the captions, Trey ended up going to Morehouse, Brandy ended up going to Spellman, which a lot of people know they're pretty much across the street from each other. Yep. So they both knew, like, and that's that's another thing, the stress of just imagine, man, you just sitting at home, you just studying. Ba, 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 ba. You know what I'm saying? Helicopters going over your house, helicopter lights shining shit. through your window. Nigga, imagine thing. you getting home from work and you sitting down trying to watch TV and hear that shit. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, just to be yeah. able to go through that, and they would just like, yo, I'm getting the fuck out of LA. And they but it becomes just- a as as somebody who just recently moved from an area like that, bro, it, it just becomes normal. You become desensitized to it. Um yeah. and and subconsciously you know like this is not a normal thing, but you become desensitized to it. And like I remember I just be playing the Xbox 
and you just hear hella gunshots. You just keep playing the Xbox like ain't nothing happened. Shit ain't happening in your yard. Keep it moving. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <clears throat> and then for them to go, both of them to go to HBCUs. You know oh, yeah. That, and so, that's another thing, too, that, that him and Spike Lee also did. They always made sure that, you know what I'm saying, they showed love to, to higher education. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Whether it be an HBCU or just a regular college. Like, they always made sure they showed, you know what I'm saying, young black people getting into that next step of education. Of course, man. Shout out and rest in peace to John Singleton, man. For sure, man. He left us with one last gem, boy. Snowfall, man. Yes, sir. For sure. So, um, man, it's time to get into these fire flames, man. You ready? Yes, sir. All right. Now, listen. Don't be mad at me. Okay. But I'm giving this a four. Okay. Okay. Um, only reason I'm giving it a four is because I don't. I feel like we didn't get enough of Angela Bassett. I think that she should have been in the movie a little bit more. Um, and you know what I'm saying. I I think we should have got a little bit more of Doughboy, man. You know what I'm saying with with how complex he was as a character. I feel like we should have got a lot more of him. I know this was a story about Trey, but I feel like, you know what I'm saying, the the movie in general was really about all three of them. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like we should have got a lot more with Doughboy. I feel like we kind of got cheated with his character. Understandable. I see I see where you're coming from. I'm gonna go a notch above you, man, uh with a four point five. Um I get what you're saying, not having enough for Reva. Uh, I think that they could have gave us a little bit more on her, a little bit more on Doughboy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think what it was, I think that John wanted to touch a lot of topics. Yeah. And, you know, trying to touch as many things as he did, I think he had to squeeze a lot of the stuff in there. Um, I'm mad about the whole scene of the, uh, when the football got stolen. None of mm-hmm. these dudes know how to throw the football. None of them know how to catch the football. They ain't know how to handle the football. Rick dropping balls out here. It's like, yo, like what the hell's going on, man? Like, yeah. Anybody in in this movie play football. Um, but I was a little disappointed with that scene. But overall, man, I just I just think that this it's a really, really great movie, great message. And I think that um starting out the gate with your first movie being a classic is uh it's a lot of expectations, but also what that movie did, it opened up a lot of like, I don't, I don't think that you would have been able to green like something like, because this came out in 91, Juice came out in 92. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you got to also think Minutes of Society came out in 93. So, yeah. Boys in the Hood really kicked this whole little thing off mm-hmm. for these movies to even get greenlit. So, um, I think that this movie laid down the foundation of it, man. So I, I, I just, I, I'm, it's, 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 it's one of those four point five that's really I can really round it up to a five. You know what I'm saying? Because it's more like a four point eight, four point seven point five. But I'm, a, I'm gonna leave it at a four point five, man. But um, it's, it's, it's really a great movie, man. It really is. Yeah, man, for sure. Um, shout out to Courtney B. Vance, man. I'm sorry. You know what I'm saying? Just, you know what I'm saying? Being the uh, husband to Angela Bassett, I always got to shout him out because he got him more. Damn it, he yes, got him more. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Black mm-hmm. Love. Um, so um, coming soon, man. We got, uh, let's see what we got on the list. We got Get Out, man. Get Out. We finally got a Jordan Peele joint, man. Yeah, man. Now, this is this is going to be super interesting because there's um, we've had a lot of time to, to look at this movie and analyze this movie properly. And it's a lot of different looks you can go into this movie. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see what you bring to the table with this one. Yeah, I know why you excited to know what I bring to the table. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So this this is gonna be I I'm gonna be able to give y'all a a personal 
Yes. Um, inside look of of some of this type shit, man. Yeah. Um. So I'm. I got. I got a story for y'all and everything. So. Um, yeah. So y'all gotta be stay. Y'all gotta stay tuned for the next one, man. I, I think yeah. that this is. Uh, I'm just. I'm just glad she never got a chance to get you into the sunken place, bro. Man, you know no, saying? no, for sure, man. That, <laughs> I never, I never felt, I never fell into that place. Even yeah. though some people may think I have because of some of the things I enjoy, but even that, mm-hmm. it wasn't because of them or well, right. that person. Right. Um, that was just because of personal taste. Um, yeah, I know. Like you know, my whole, my whole story. You know, I told you about. You know, what I'm saying how I fuck with Evanescence, man. And oh yeah, for sure. And, like, you know, what I'm saying? I mean, they, but that's that's one of them things, like. It's a it's a bunch of black people who enjoy it. They just don't realize who Evanescence is. That's and it's that, and I think that some people just ashamed and scared to think. Yeah, what think about fuck them. that, man. Listen like, to Evanescence, Nirvana. You got to listen to all them joints, man. Red Hot Chili Peppers, all them. Hey, yeah, man. I was listening to my I was listening to my rock playlist today. You know what I'm saying? No Guns and Roses. You know what I mean? Little mm-hmm. uh, little Led Zeppelin. You know what I'm saying? Hey, man. When, when shit smells like time. when smells like Teen Spirit comes on, bro. You just gotta go with the flow. <laughs> I'm just being honest. You just gotta go with hey, the flow, bro. Hey, I didn't realize how much uh the Beatles uh come together, man. Hey, oh man, you talking about that shit classic? Oh, man. You turn it up. Them Jones be hey, beating listen. in the speakers. Hey, bro. listen, and I'm talking about I'm talking about I ain't talking about no remakes. No, I'm talking about the Beatles. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mike Mike did his Mike thing stole, on it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, he, yeah. He, he started the whole catalog. Mike is a dirty dude, but I know he bought that he bought that old masters, man. But um, yeah, y'all stay tuned, man. We got we got a we got a really good one for y'all, man. Because man, it's that movie took took the world by storm, man. Sure, for sure. And and listen, ain't nothing scarier than than being the only black dude in a house full of white folks. Tell you that much right now. I've been there. In a small town of Kaiser, West mm-hmm. Virginia. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I've, right. I've been there. I've been there in this in a smaller version of a town called Dixie. So I know exactly how you feel, bro. I used to live in a place called Trotwood as well, around a, a group of white folks, and it's not fun. <laughs> ain't, nothing, ain't nothing cool about that shit. But uh, yeah, man, listen. If y'all enjoyed the show, uh, if y'all didn't enjoy the show, if y'all want to comment, if y'all want to tell us how great we did, if y'all want to tell us, hey, y'all need to do better, whatever the case may be, contact us, man, via socials um, on IG and Twitter at ViewAnonPod. Um, you can hit us up on Facebook as well at VA Pod Watch Group. You can find me at uh, on Twitter at Scoots Bronson, and you can go to my um, profile. All my links are in the bio. Yes, sir, man. Y'all can find me at uh, S.Foster8 on Instagram and Twitter at 28 Minutes or Less Pod. That is on IG. Uh, fresh new episode episode for y'all, man. Episode 84 of the podcast dropped yesterday. Uh, Ozark Season 4 Part 2. You know what I'm saying? I got to finish that. So I put out a pod of my thoughts on how to end the show. So go check that out on all major platforms. Let me know what y'all think and appreciate y'all support. Oh, man, I also want to tell you, uh, thank you for dropping them Ozark joints because it helps me in the conversations at work when people be talking about Ozark because I don't be knowing what, what's going on because I don't <laughs> watch it. But because of you, I, I, I'm able to uh, talk about certain stuff. I just repeat everything you be saying. You heard the new one yet? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, okay. We ain't okay. got to that point yet because everybody ain't finished it. But when they do, everybody ain't finished it. I'm going to be ready. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to definitely be ready. So yes, I appreciate buddy. you for that one. <laughs> no problem. No, no problem. <clears throat> yes, sir. So, man, listen, man. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you guys for listening. Your support, you know what I'm saying, is always greatly appreciated. Um, and until the next episode, man, like they say in Hollywood, that is a wrap. Cut. <laughs>